Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to Presbyterian Church. We have Reverend Larry Jackman with us, stated clerk with the Presbytery. Uh, we have just a few announcements. First, we're going to do the Christmas Joy Offering during the last hymn. If you forgot, we'll be collecting again next week. And Bob Lorimer had an announcement. There if you're on the west side of Bloomington today, between 2 and 5 p.m., uh, you might drop by the uh, Half Price Bookstore next to Pet Boys and uh, come in and swell the crowd uh, where I'll be signing my book. Special Christmas price today. Thank you. Oops. Is it another one? Oh, I, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I just have an announcement. I have good news and I have bad news. Uh -oh. um, Paulina's son is here with us this, uh, today. <coughs> Yeah. We're going to miss her in the choir, too. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Got to get all my signals straight here. <laughs> get to the hymn, Miriam is going to come and uh, help us sing Joy to the World. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms.
But this we call to mind, and therefore we have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Let us live as God's children in peace, loving one another, and always praising God. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now the Lord be with you. And also I with you. Let us share the peace with one another. Oh, yes. He forgot it. Hey, who else? Who else? He forgot it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. We welcome Julie and Bob Hamill, who will like the Advent candle. We know the truth of God's love because he sent us the Christ child to be our Savior. John verse, uh, John chapter 15, verse 9, as, as my Father loves me, so have I loved you. Now I remain in my love. <coughs> chapters earlier in the most famous of all such declarations 316 for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son an often overlooked word there is world the child whose birth we revere with this annual season wasn't just intended for the tiny area that Herod thought he ran or for even the vast, more vast group of believers who were awaiting a savior. Christ was intended to show the world how to live, that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. His life, his birth and his death, and the 33 earth-shaking years in between was our greatest demonstration of God's love and of our need to share it, to practice it, and to pass it on. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you on this day for teaching us how to love in a God-like, Christ-like way, sacrificing as we need to accomplish the work that began on this day that we celebrated above all others, this day of the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. Children, want to come forward? Or not. <laughs> so cooperative. <laughs> I am so moved. Thank you. Logan, thank you. Okay. So, 
I was going to, I know you guys are dog lovers, right? Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. And sometimes you got to clean up after them, right? <laughs> Not. Okay. All right. I'm a, I'm a big dog lover, too. Who's the biggest dog lover you ever saw, do you guess? I don't know. Do you think you knew anybody or you know anybody who loved dogs enough to be born in a kennel? To live in a doghouse? To eat Alpo? <laughs> <laughs> to just be a dog? Yeah, me either. Me either. Even though I really love my dog, and sometimes I let him come and be like me. I let him jump up on my bed. I bet nobody's done that in your house. And, <laughs> uh, and I let him wipe his wet feet wherever he wants to wipe them. And I let him chase the cat. And I let him do all kinds of things. But I still don't love my dog enough to be a dog. But the Christmas story says what? What does it say about dogs? Doesn't say anything about dogs. <laughs> says something about people, and it says that God loved people enough to become a people. Pardon? To God. Yeah. God loves people enough to become a human being, and to be born in a barn, and to put up with smelly animals. Huh? Well. Born in a barn, born in a manger, and that a barn, sort of. Yeah. So the whole Christmas story is about God's love being way beyond anything we can figure out and think about. It's, it's like Him loving dogs enough to become a dog. Now we're not dogs, but dogs are pretty cool. Yeah. All right. All right, I guess that's about all, because you don't need more to come up here, and I appreciate that, okay? <laughs> it gave you something to do, right? And now we are going to sing our song. Do we know how to do that? I do not know how to do that. Rachel, will you teach me? <laughs> <laughs> Who starts it? Please don't say you do. <laughs> okay. Peace. 
trembling tribes the law in cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. What child is this? Tis God with us, In preparation for our prayers, uh, I ask you what your particular concerns are today, both for the world and for the world far away and for the world close to us. Do we have a uh, particular? Yes, ma'am. We have a dear friend that was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He's a, uh, his name is Dave. He's a dentist I used to work for. And also, my daughter's husband just lost his job and they lost all their help. And she's very ill with MS, so it's very concerning to us. Thank you. What other concerns do we have? Sorry. Um, Steph, I don't have my glasses. Do you think it'd be a good idea? <laughs> Stephanie takes care of me on normal days. Cool. <laughs> it works. Um, there are a lot of people at Ellsville who experienced flooding last night and are dealing with cleanup issues this morning. Other concerns? Oh, sorry. Travel mercies for me. I'm flying to Florida Christmas Eve to visit my son. <coughs> my name is Phyllis. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out whether I'm going to resent you for going to Florida. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll, we'll. The mercies piece. Okay. It's good to be there. Anything else? And for our departing sister, Heading home to to what country? Yes. Ghana. Ghana. Heading home to Ghana. Let us pray together. Lord God, we uh, we give you thanks for this day and for the the love that you put in our hearts for others and even for ourselves. We ask you to uh, be uniquely and particularly present and strongly present to those in great need, to Dave and his, uh, his bad diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, to uh, a child and uh, an in-law in the loss of a job, to people in uh, the county and in the area who have uh, clean up to do after floods and who are fighting rising waters. To each one of us in our particular need, give us your mercies. Give us your mercies when we travel and grant us your presence. Give us your presence and your love when we celebrate the family love that we have with each other and, and the opportunities to share that at this season. Give us your mercies when we know strongly the loss that we've experienced throughout the years and the 
the people who are absent at the holidays and, and everything that uh, separates us from each other and help us bind ourselves to you because you bind us to those people and to each other. Give us today what we need and support us through these days that we may bring to you good and acceptable offerings of ourselves. We pray these things for your love's sake and we ask you to hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us. Praying, Our Father, <coughs> who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Let us continue our worship with the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Isaiah chapter 7 verses 10 through 16 in your pew Bible that's five, page 525 and in large print 1059 again the Lord spoke to Ahaz ask the Lord your God for a sign whether in the deepest depth or in the highest heights but Ahaz said I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with birth, with child, and will give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread 
will be laid waste. And our New Testament reading comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. In your view Bible, that's page 737, and in the large print, 1486. And this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Last time I said yes to being here, uh, I got snowed out, and uh, I almost got rained out last night. I guess so. I was I was uh, at home watching the the local weather, thinking, well, I wonder if 46 is going to be open this morning. And mm -hmm. It it was mostly, but there was one place it was like three fourths covered, but I could still get through. So it's nice to be here, and I apologize for uh, the last minute changes. A couple of weeks ago, but it's uh, it is what it needed to be, and, and uh, I was glad that Susan actually uh, insisted that she cover it instead of me. So. Will you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Theology is often expressed best in a kind of simplicity that comes from childlike logic. And I remember back a few decades ago, uh, I had a group of junior high kids in confirmation class. And one of the things that I always did with my confirmation class kids was we'd, we'd go around from place to place in the community and uh, visit other churches and give my kids a taste of what, the, uh, what their neighbors experienced in, in terms of a faith experience. Uh, that, that was always kind of fun to do. And in this little town, I took them over to the Catholic Church one day, and my buddy, Father Vito Lepardo, was uh, happy to help me instruct. He always was. And so with great care, Vito brought out the chalice, the communion chalice, to show to the kids. And he made a point of the fact that the chalice was lined with gold. He intones, this is lined with gold. Pretty impressive to Presbyterian kids because normally what we did is looked up front and saw lined with aluminum. Uh, <laughs> but this was with gold. But it wasn't too impressive to one of my kids. And Jim Putney looks at the uh, chalice and he asks the scandalous question. <laughs> Why gold? Why is it lined with gold? Well, Father Lepardo uh, puffs himself up a little bit more and in his best pastoral tone he said, 
because we believe that the wine actually becomes the blood of Christ. And so Jim says, oh, I know that. We study the presence of Christ in communion. I know that, but why is it lined with gold? Well, my priest friend was lost at that point. He just didn't have an answer. So let me ask you the question, what's the purpose of a gold lining in a communion chalice? Skip over whether or not you believe that Jesus is physically present in the, in the act of communion. That's not the point. The point is, if it is Christ, how does gold become all that important? Is the costly gold a necessary thing? Now here's where this is going. The traditional story of Christmas suggests an answer to that last question. It says gold not only is unnecessary, but that perhaps it is even a contradiction to the real truth. That the presence of God in this world, entering through a smelly feeding trough in a barn, finds no home in a gold-lined container. The most radical thing in all of Christianity is that the eternal and all-powerful God who created a universe is filling the human flesh and blood and using that for a lining. God the Almighty invades the human scene where you and I live and move and have our being. And God was everything human. And yet, we're not too fond of that fact. The fact is that the very essence of Christian Christianity and the Christian message and the Christmas message is that God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. God claimed the human condition as holy beyond any of our imaginations. And that sounds good until we start to spell out the implications. I was at lunch a couple of weeks ago, and a group of people at the table were reminiscing about Christmas traditions in other places and times. Stephanie, you didn't hear this. Uh, but one of the stories that was told, you didn't hear that I'm retelling the story, one of the stories that was told was about a nativity scene in a church where the Mary doll in the nativity scene was built in such a way that she was capable of delivering the baby Jesus doll. Interesting. And I took the comment that stuck with me most, uh, and I think it was something like, "Ew." <laughs> <laughs> but wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's really wrong with that? I suspect that the bottom line truth is that we are only willing to let this incarnation business go so far. And when we get to that point, we want to draw a line, we want somehow to prevent the full humanity of our Savior. Forgetting, of course, that when we limit that humanity, we limit our own salvation. God wanted to save the whole of who and what we are. And the way that that has happened, according to classical thought, was that God has to do something like accept the full humanity. And it, as an acceptable place for even God to live. And for us, the implication number one is that when we are considering the presence of God in human form, the incarnation, in the incarnation, God baptized all of human life. All of it. Not just the pretty stuff. So when you look at our lives, we're given a clear message. We are told that there is nothing that is really foreign to God in us. That anything that is in us and is intrinsic to us is something that God claims also. And yet there are elements and activities and thoughts and aspirations and desires that we dare not disclose even to ourselves, much less to a loved one, 
and we certainly don't have any capacity to confess those to God. And you know what that does to us? When we can't accept a part of who we are and what we are, it condemns us to a living hell of isolation, humiliation, emotional pain. It does that if we're lucky, and if we're not lucky, it gives us so much self-contempt that we cannot even bear to look at the image in the mirror. We know that we have all seen a denial of who we are and what we are, and we've all experienced it from ourselves and from others, in our loved ones and even within our churches. It is the rejection of God's habitat. Thinking that the environment is inappropriate for us is even an honest recognition. Do you know who the shepherds were? They were a social underclass that was looked down upon with contempt and scorn. Rejected by any proper people, they were not some sort of idyllic little people out in the, in the woods or in the, the meadows taking care of sheep. They were people who were looked down upon severely. In our culture, they might be the people who do, do laundry in nursing homes, who scavenge scrap metal along the highways, the migrant workers, and so on. These were the people who did, were not included in our places of worship and not in the places of worship in the first century. They were the people who did not come to those places and do not come to our places for good reason. And yet, the shepherds were the first people to greet the birth of the Messiah. God continues in that day, through this day, to claim the humanity of shepherds and of us. Who were the wise men? New Age weirdos with some kind of Eastern philosophy going for themselves? Who knows, maybe the equivalent of a group of Muslims on a pilgrimage? These folks, too, did not fit the image of who was supposed to be there. Maybe they were rich, but for Pete's sake, they were foreigners. Did God enter the world to salvage their their heresy, and their lack of proper religion? Yep, guess so. Who is already at the manger in our world? The addict? The thief? The social or sexual misfit? The people we don't agree with and don't like and don't even want to look upon? Any expression of real humanity is claimed by God and is claimed in the Christmas event. The second implication that we really need to catch on to is that our job is to extend God's embrace to all of humanity, to all of our sisters and brothers, everywhere and anywhere. We are certainly not gold line wrappers ourselves. However, we are wrapping enough according to God. So also is the second stranger you meet when you go outside the church this afternoon. The, the first one for that matter, and the third one too. Again, the image of the new pope <laughs> inspires me and fascinates me. There's a picture of Francis kissing a man and embracing him who has neurofibromatosis. And... Uh, if you've seen the picture, it explains itself. If you haven't seen the picture, um, go look for it. it it's, it's an acute disorder. There's a picture of him embracing this man with tumorous outgrowths all over his face. He is um, wrapping enough for humanity. That picture says it all. It appears to say that the very divine nature of human flesh, even if it is deformed and diseased, is good enough for God. 
and is good enough for the Pope. God walks these streets and these pathways. God is common, God is ordinary. It is almost Christmas. God is very human and so are you, which makes you and I and all of us very, very God-like. Every religion I have ever studied has the capacity to exile God or banish him to some distant place or even more distant posture. Every religion that I can think of has the capacity to behold this awesome and removed and remote God. Christianity is often just another religious expression that loves the task of beholding some otherworldly reality, some completely other God. We pray like the rest of them do to a God in some other realm. And the radical nature of our faith that keeps trying to assert itself is that God is not to be this entity that strikes us mute with its awesomeness. God instead, according to the Christmas message, is a, is a God not to behold, but to be held. So reach out. Behold the presence of God in humanity. It's where he chose to live. Inside your skin and inside mine. Behold God. God wants to be held. Amen.
peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be with you, Eve.